Hello, welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast. I'm Scott Miller, your weekly host and interviewer. Today's guest is one of the 30 master mentors in my recent release from HarperCollins titled that, Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, culled from all the guests on the first two years of our podcast. And I've just finished writing the volume two in the series Master Mentors, featuring 30 new mentors and 30 new transformational insights, both books available for order or pre-order on Amazon. Our guest today is Stephen M. R. Covey, the former CEO of the Covey Leadership Center, the, the uh, seminal author of the book, the Speed of Trust, who is now out with a new release today, Trust and Inspire. Joining us from his home here in Utah, Stephen M. R. Covey. Welcome to On Leadership. Hey, Scott. It's so great to be with you again. I'm always excited to be on this show with you. Stephen, honored to have you back. This is not your first appearance. In fact, you were the brave, courageous soul that agreed to lend your credibility to our podcast four years ago as the first guest. And as a result of that, of course, your interview has the most number of listens and watches and downloads. You're both the first guest and you're the 200th and first guest. Thank you for showing uh, uh, faith in us four years ago and for coming back for this interview. Appreciate your friendship, your humility, and the wisdom you share in all of your books. Stephen, for the last few people who may be aware of your name but not aware of your work, would you rewind a couple of decades and just give our listeners and viewers a tutorial on where you went to school, what your career has been like, both as an executive officer and as an author and thought leader, and then kind of end it with your current release, Trust and Inspire. Okay, great. Um, well, I uh, did my MBA, Harvard Business School, and I remember coming out of business school debating what I should do. I had an opportunity to go into uh, real estate development, which I'd done prior, and I loved that. I had an opportunity to go into investment banking in New York City, which I'd done in the prior summer, loved that. And then I had an opportunity to join up with my father at a, at a small little company called Stephen R. Covey and Associates that became Covey Leadership Center. And, and, you know, if you just looked at the three opportunities, they all looked like two were very legitimate and real and big, great opportunities. The other was an unknown. But I'll, I'll never forget my father. Um, he said, look, these other things are great and you could do exciting things there. But uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to make meaning and we're gonna make a difference and we're gonna make a dent in the universe in effect, he said. And, uh, and, and I knew that the seven habits was about to come out and I knew that that was gonna go uh, well and resonate with people. So I chose to join with him and, and, uh, and it became the Covey Leadership Center. And I stayed uh, and did a number of different things starting on the sales side and kind of worked my way until um, I learned the business and then I became our president and CEO and led the, the business to, to do work all around the world. And then we did a merger with Franklin Quest, with the Covey Leadership Center to form Franklin Covey. And, and, um, and I was there for another five years on that as we merged, integrated these companies. And then that was act one. <laughs> and then I went down act two, which is after the merger, I saw how if you could build trust, it changed everything because because we had been arch competitors and there was kind of low trust, not because either party had done anything to the other, but because we were, had been competitors. And I saw how we went from low trust to high trust when we worked on building it intentionally. And I felt like I found my voice of what I wanted to say, to talk about trust. So then I went to act two, which was, I started to work on the book, The Speed of Trust. And I published that, been speaking on that and been doing that for the last really uh, 18 years. And now I'm at the point where I've come out with this new work, Trust and Inspire, which is how truly great leaders unleash greatness in others. So I've taken the same trust theme, but I've added to it the importance of inspiration and really a style of leadership, the kind of leadership that is needed in our world today. I call it trust and inspire as opposed to command and control. So that's a little bit of a journey for me, and it's been exciting, and it's, it's been a thrill. And I, I still believe that my greatest contributions are in front of me, and I'm excited about that. Stephen, you and I have had the privilege, I've had the privilege of knowing you for 
my 26 years inside the organization. You, of course, share the name of your famous father, Dr. Stephen R. Covey, the author of the seminal book you mentioned, The Seven Habits, and our co-founder. You, of course, wrote the book, as you mentioned, Speed of Trust, sold you know, uh, upwards of nearly 3 million copies now worldwide. Your new release today is Trust and Inspire. A, a little bit of a first blush, kind of a similar topic. What would you say is the biggest difference between your new work, Trust and Inspire, and the seminal work that you created called The Speed of Trust? What, is this just a next generation? Is it the learnings from the last thousand keynote speeches you've given? What's different about Trust and Inspire than your first book, Speed of Trust? Yes, it's different in kind than Speed of Trust. There's some common elements, of course, because trust is part of it. Um, but Speed of Trust is all about how leaders and teams and organizations can build high trust teams and cultures and how to build that kind of trust. Trust and Inspire is all about the style of leadership that is needed in a new world of work where everything around us has changed and is changing right in front of our eyes. And yet we're still leading too often with a similar style of leadership that kind of grew out of the industrial age. We've just become better at it, more advanced, more sophisticated, more enlightened in our command and control. I call it, I call it enlightened command and control, but it's not really relevant for a new world of work where you've got intentionally flexible work and people working from home, working from anywhere, hybrid, all the different combinations where people have choices and options, where there's such diversity like never before, where there's such change and disruption going on. And, and it requires a different kind of leadership that is really gonna be relevant for this world today. And so Trust and Inspire is really representing a leadership style that is timely, and relevant for what is needed in our new world of work today. And so it's a broader book, it's a leadership book. It's a book about people and a book about leadership and the kind of leadership that's needed in a new world of work. That's the idea. And it's, it's kind of a broader, bigger idea in the sense that it's covering a larger base. Now, you still want to build trust within this model, but this is gonna focus more largely on, on what leaders do to unleash the potential, the greatness, the, the uh, capacity of their people to stay relevant in a changing world. So Stephen, take that a step further, if you will. The, the Speed of Trust, as I mentioned, has sold nearly 3 million copies. It is, if not the, one of the most uh, in-demand offerings inside of Franklin Covey's All Access Pass as a single day or multi-day leadership solution. There will be a Trust and Inspire offering also in the All Access Pass in short order. Uh, give us a sneak peek. What does it mean practically? What does it feel like, look like to work for a Trust and Inspire leader? Yes. Well, let me ask you this. Um, I'll, I'll kind of uh, look at it this way. Think about, I ask each of our listeners and our viewers, think about when you worked with someone, maybe it was a boss um, or someone that could have been in, elsewhere in your life, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's a family member, a friend, someone who, who believed in you, who saw your potential, who saw your talent, who saw your capabilities, and maybe they believed in you more than you believed in your stuff, and who also really inspired you because of who they were and how they connected you to what you were good at and what, was, what mattered to you, and also to a broader sense of purpose what that did to you. My guess is most of us have had someone like that in my life. I know I have. My, my father was that for me personally. I had someone in my first job, John Walsh, who someone believed in me when I was doing real estate development more than I believed in myself and what that did to me, how it ignited me and helped me come to believe in myself and how I developed my capabilities because of this person. I bet we've all had someone like that. Scott, have you had someone like that? someone who believed in you, a trust and inspire leader in your life. In fact, I can remember the name of the hotel, the name of the conference room, and if you drove me there, I could point to you what chair I was sitting in when you came up behind me back in 1999 and you put your hand on my shoulder 
and you gripped me, and you just learned that the company had made a decision to transfer me to our London office, our UK office, for about a year. And you gripped my shoulder, and you told me how proud that you were that I was going to represent us in the London office, and you wished me well. And that was in 19, that was about November of 1999. You were one of those trusted, inspired leaders in my own career. Wow, well, thank you. I didn't realize that. But, but if I did anything right, it's because I learned from others that mm. pass it on to me, that someone who inspired me. And so I tried to pay it forward. And, and, um, and I'll bet for most of our listeners and viewers, you can identify someone in your life, a boss, a, a, a friend, a colleague, a clergy, a coach, a mentor, and what that did for you. Now imagine what if you could become that kind of person for somebody else that saw their potential, that helped them, that communicated their potential to them, that developed their potential, and then that really unleashed their potential for the betterment of everybody, for their growth, but also for delivering better results for the, the organization. That's the idea of Trust and Inspire is that it brings out the best in people. It helps us win in that war for talent to attract, retain, engage, and inspire the best people and to bring out the best in people. And it also helps us stay relevant in a changing world because through trust and inspiration, we can collaborate and innovate in new and different ways to stay relevant in this changing world. And you can't do that very well with the old style of leadership, command and control, even the more sophisticated version of enlightened command and control. You can't command and control your way to collaboration and innovation. And you can't command and control your way to a high trust culture that inspires people. We need a new way to lead in this new world, trust and inspire. And my guess is most of us could point to someone like that. What if we could become that person for others? What if we could build a culture that had trust and inspire as a style of leadership that was the dominant style instead of the exception and, and, and really uh, end command and control as we know it and move to a whole new way of leading. That's the vision behind this book because we need this in our world. We need it in our society. We need it in our organizations, on our teams. And, and, um, and Trust and Inspire is, is what's going to ignite the, the potential within people, the capacity, the inspiration, but also will enable us to produce and to perform at new and different levels that you can never even conceive of with command and control. So that's the whole idea behind this. And, and it's never been more important than in our world today with all that's gone on, all the changes, and people have so many choices and options, the great resignation, everything else we might call it, the great rephrasing, rethinking, where people want to, if they can choose to say, I wanna be part of working with Scott, working with this team, this organization, why? Because they trust me and they inspire me and I choose to be part of it. That's a better way to lead in today's world. Stephen, your vision and your writing is of course contagious. I can't help of course to be a bit of a skeptic because there's no shortage of leadership books. You know, look behind me, right? We've sold 60 million copies or more of the books that Franklin Covey has published, including our ability to uh, promote your book, Speed of Trust and Now Trust and Inspire. With so many leadership books out there, why aren't there more great leaders? I mean, the level of disengagement, if you believe the, the polls and the engagement studies, Gallup's recent study, that disengagement has never been perhaps higher. Where is the disconnect? Why aren't there more trust and inspired leaders with all the work that's been done in leadership? I'll give you a couple of thoughts on that. First, um, the idea that fish discover water last, the French proverb. We're so immersed in a world of command and control that we've, that's emerged out of the industrial age that we're not even often aware of it, but it's in our language. You know, you know terms like span of control uh, and, and um, subordinates and silos and, and these different words that are just right into our language of how we describe it. And we're so immersed in it, we're not even aware that we're perpetuating a command and control mindset. Another reason though, is at some level, we all kind of know that this shift needs to take place, but to know and not to do is not to know. The challenge here is in the action, in the doing, not in the knowledge, but in the, in the, in the behavior that follows the action. And we need to align 
our style with our intent, our action with our knowledge. And, and that's what needs to come along. And, and, and that's getting in the way. And then another is that our, you know, the old paradigm of leadership that's rooted from the industrial age, it just it continues to live on. And old paradigms can live on indefinitely, even when a better paradigm has come to supplant it. It's like bloodletting. That was created 3,000 years ago, you know, from the Egyptians and went through the Romans and it went into Europe in the, in the 1600s. And, but it was practiced as late as the late 1800s after it had been disproven 250 years earlier. But the, the mindsets, you know, the practices, the patterns continued, even when the paradigm had shifted. It hadn't fully shifted yet in the practice. In a sense, command and control is modern day bloodletting. And we need a break with the old style in order to have a breakthrough. That's what's needed today. And that's trust and inspire. All these things kind of trap us in the old model of leadership. And I'll give you one last one is that perhaps the biggest barrier in moving from command and control in our leadership style to trust and inspire and becoming a trust and inspire leader Perhaps the biggest barrier is that barrier is that we think we already are one, that we've already done it. And we kind of think, well, I'm not command and control, so I must be trust and inspire. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, someone might be trying to get away from command and control, but may not be leading. They might be advocating and abandoning, but are they trusting and inspiring? And so it's really kind of trying to name what it is that we're going toward and what we need to become. I'll give you a quick example of this. I saw, I'd been working and consulting with a leader who was so anxious to be different than his predecessor, who was very much a command and control leader that this, this, this leader coming in afterwards in his desire to not be command and control, he wasn't, he hadn't moved to trust and inspire. What had happened is he wasn't really leading. He was so fearful of, of having expectations and, and accountability that he really was advocating and abandoning. And, and uh, that's not going to inspire anyone either. And so command and control, you know, trust and inspire is not the opposite of command and control. That's advocate and abandon. It's a third alternative that's strong, that's, that's got standards and expectations, that's authoritative without being authoritarian, that's strong without being forceful. And, and, um, and that's, you know, decisive without being autocratic. That's what a trust and inspire leader can do. And so that, that's part of what's getting in the way. We need more models of it. We need more mentors of this kind of leadership that's needed today so that we can learn from that and be coached and mentored by, by that and can spread it and can pass it on and pay it forward. Those are all parts of the reasons why we remain still stuck in command and control, because the data shows that it's still about nine out of 10 leaders that are still in some version of command and control. To that point, can you be a trust, how do you become a trust and inspire leader in a command and control structure, culture? You go first. Someone needs to go first. That's what leaders do. Leaders go first. You're trying to become a model who then could become a mentor. You're trying to show a way, a path forward, and, and, and to say there's a better way to lead where we both get the result, but do it in a way that grows the people. Where we get the result in a way that inspires a high trust team, a high trust culture, so we can get the result again and again. And someone needs to go first. It's very easy to kind of say, look, command, uh, trust and inspire, it's a good idea, but it won't work here. Not on my team or not with my boss, or not in our company, or not in our industry. We're a very regulated, compliance-based industry. But you know what? Those all might be facts. It doesn't, though, disempower us from saying we can still work right within our circle of influence and give people a model of a trust and inspire leader, even in a command and control culture, where you both get the result, but you still grow the people and build the relationship. And, and, and unleash people and their capabilities. And I would argue that it's actually more important than ever before to do this because we'll get better results. There's overwhelming data 
being part of a high trust culture that inspires people, how people perform better. In fact, even bet more than just engagement, when people feel inspired, the data from Bain shows 6% more productive than even when they're fully engaged. And so there's another frontier, another air that people can kick into when they're inspired and they'll perform better. And so we'll get better outcomes and we need models who can become mentors. And that shows that this is not soft and weak, it's really strong. And it is the kind of leadership people want and are craving. In fact, a study from, from a Zanger Folkman showed that they looked at 16 different leadership attributes. The number one attribute that people wanted to see from their leader is that they wanted their leader to inspire them. And, and um, you know, it wasn't that, that my leader is forceful and, and, you know, and this and that. It was that my leader inspires me. And, and, and yet it was woefully lacking in what they were getting from their leaders. And, and so if we can fill that void and give people a model of what trust inspired leadership looks like at our company, where people say it's not possible on our team, in our industry, and become a model of this, who then could become a mentor, will begin to then have a ripple effect of this and it'll become a virtuous upward spiral. So I'm not downplaying how hard this is. What I am saying is we've become clear of what doesn't work, which is command and control. We need to now become equally clear of what does work. Trust and inspire, what that means and how we go about to achieving it. Stephen, thanks for that. It's basically a primer in leadership. Uh, let's get real. I want you to speak as practically as possible because trust and inspire can be fairly aspirational, inspirational, ethereal terms. What, is, what does it look like? What, what behavior, if, you, if you, were, yep. you have someone listening right now, they're watching from anywhere around in the world, which millions are to this episode, while they're going and buying your book on Amazon or their book uh, store of preference, what would you like them to start doing differently today? What's a common behavior you see from perhaps people like me that are well-intended, competent leaders that fall into a command and control style? And we want to start behaving differently so we inspire our people. What's the first thing the Scott Millers of the world should do differently starting today? Yes. Well, there's three key things. Three, I call these stewardships of a trust and inspire leader. And that's the whole mindset also that leadership is stewardship. That's a fundamental belief I have. Leadership is not a position and it's not a right. It's a, it's a, a, a responsibility. It's a stewardship I have. And there's three key stewardships in, for becoming a trust and inspire leader. First, they model. Second, they trust others. Third, they inspire others. So modeling, trusting, inspiring. Modeling is who we are. Trusting is how we lead. Inspiring is connecting to why. So what's the first thing you do? You model the behavior. You go first. You model the behavior that you want to see. You be the model of that. And that's your, that's your credibility. That's your moral authority. And that's your going first. You're being the first to talk straight. You're being the first to be transparent. You're being the first to extend trust to people. You're being the first to do anything and that's difficult. You're being the first to live the values. And, and in particular, we really want to model today. There's a lot of different behavioral attributes and behaviors to model, but if we can model um, the idea of being authentic, authenticity and vulnerability, it's what we're seeking in our leaders today, authenticity, that they're real, and they're not putting on airs or fronts, you know, to be rather than to seem. And then vulnerability where I can see into that person. They open themselves up. They declare their intent. They even declare themselves. And they're real and open. And think of vulnerability in terms of the word intimacy. And take that word and make it into me see. I can see inside. And yes, in being vulnerable, I feel like there's a little bit of risk of that. But the very act of doing that builds trust and it builds a relationship and people respond to it. And so what do you do? You go first, you model the behavior. That'd be the very first thing. Then I would say, focus on trusting. 
and becoming more trusting of our people, of, of each other, of, of colleagues and peers, of partners and customers. Now look, I'm not Pollyannish. I'm not just saying trust anyone and everyone regardless of the situation. You gotta be, use good judgment. I call it smart trust, but find the ways that you as a leader can become more trusting of others because that's what the greatest need is. And yes, we to have trust, you have to be trustworthy. We also have to be trusting. And I find what's holding us back more than trustworthiness is that we're not trusting enough. That's why it's an entire stewardship in and of itself to trust our people, to trust our teams. And during this pandemic, there's been a great opportunity for some companies and leaders to build more trust with their people as people have worked from home, worked from anywhere in high flexible work by telling the people that they trust them and having the people believe it and feel it and experience it. I've also seen some leaders and companies go the other direction when they tell them they trust them, but then they're hovering over, in, hovering over them and micromanaging them from a distance or using surveillance software that screams, I don't really trust you. So trusting is the second one. And then finally, inspiring. I'll maybe come back to this one, Scott, that deserves its own treatment, but you want to also inspire people. And because that's better than just motivating them. That's external, extrinsic. Inspiration is internal. It's intrinsic. It's inside us people. And, and we're trying to ignite that fire within that can burn on for decades or at least for years or, or months. But whereas the, the other, the, the motivation has to be almost... Uh, fed with it like a hungry bear that you're feeding constantly with new stimuli constantly to kind of keep people motivated to get more rewards versus an inspiration that burns on for sometimes years. Stephen, this book is a labor of love. You've spent nearly a decade writing this and researching. You've spoken all over the world. This is your next seminal contribution to the library that is rapidly growing from you. Uh, how would you advise organizations to use this book? I'm sure you've been asked this question. Should it be in a book club? Should it be starting at the, at the more senior levels? We have an offering that will be coming available shortly in the All Access Pass. But as the book is available now, what, is the, what do you think is the best way for leaders in organizations to begin reading the book and sharing the concepts? I think it's all of the above, Scott. I think you can apply this at every level. I think you can apply it personally as a leader if you just pick up the book. I think you can apply it as a team, as an organization, through book clubs, through learning and, and other processes to really engage in this through coaching, all kinds of ways. The whole idea is that we've got to shift the leadership style and we've got to get out of command and control, even the enlightened command and control version and move into a different style of leadership, trust and inspire it is gonna be far more relevant in our new world and it's what people want. And yet we don't know how to do it. And so while I've highlighted the three stewardships, you model, you trust, you inspire, we still have got to get good at how we can do this and, and focus on how we can build the agreements that help us extend more trust through expectations and accountability. And also how we can really intentionally become good at inspiring others. And that's where I separate inspiration from charisma. And I make the bold statement that everyone can inspire. It's a learnable skill. And you inspire others when you connect with people by finding your why and helping others find theirs, but also through caring at the interpersonal level and through belonging at the team level. That inspires people. And you inspire others when you connect people to purpose, to meaning, the contribution, that's all learnable. And so you can get good at this. And that's the whole idea is that this represents a leadership style that is more accurate, more complete, more relevant for our world today. And so I just would encourage people to look at this at two levels. One is at the macro level, that how do I move from command and control to trust and inspire? Because even though we might think we're trust and inspire, the data shows that 90% of us are still in some form of command and control. So I wanna do that at the macro level. Then I wanna to move to the more specific micro level of, okay, so if I'm gonna make the leap and move to trust and inspire, I've gotta challenge my fundamental beliefs of how I see people and how I see leaders, leadership. And I need to focus on those three stewardships of modeling, of trusting and inspiring. 
So I would ask our listeners and our viewers, if you think of those three stewardships, modeling, trusting, and inspiring, if you were to pick one of those that you feel like maybe you need to work on to become a more trusted and inspired leader, as we walk out of this, this uh, On Leadership podcast today, which one would it be? Start working on that one. Get better at it. Move the needle on it. And it will just show you how trust and inspire is a learnable competency of leading in a new way. And you can all get good at this. We all can. We can become trust and inspire leaders. So get started. Pick one of those three stewardships to work on. Get going. So I just would say, get started. Get going. Try this. Test this. It's a better way to lead in our new world of work. Stephen, the book is obviously written as an organizational leadership book. It's actually a great parenting book. As I've read it and thought about how I trust and inspire with my wife, Stephanie, our three young sons who you've met, it's been, uh, it's been pervasive in my life that you came back on as episode 201. You were the very first episode you trusted and inspired us back when we had no listeners and no guests four years ago. It's been a delight to see your success, your influence, and your journey, not to mention the success of one of your children. I think most people know watching this now of the many children you and your wife have. You have one in particular who's been in the spotlight recently. Talk a little bit about Britton and what's happening there. Yes, yeah, so this is my son, Britton Covey, and he has played football for the University of Utah the last several years. <laughs> and and uh, he's uh, had a great career. He was named first team All-American as a return specialist. And now he has declared for the NFL draft. And that happens at the end of the month here in April. And we don't know if he'll get drafted, but we do think that someone will pick him up if he doesn't get drafted and, and give him a chance. And he's a product of Trust and Inspire because uh, he's small. He's only five foot eight, not a lot of five foot eight football players, but coming out of high school, at first he had no offers, no opportunities. No one thought he could do it. They thought you know, you're a good high school player, but just too small to play at the college level. But then someone believed in him. Kyle Whittingham, the head coach of the University of Utah, believed in him, saw his greatness, took a chance on him and said, Britton, we don't see size. We see a player. We want you to come join us. And so he joined, he went to the University of Utah, had a great career, but his talent was unleashed by a leader who believed in him. Now he's got a chance to maybe go to the NFL. It's tough, it's a tough gig to get on, but we'll see what happens. But I believe in him, he's a trust and inspire a kid. He's a product of trust and inspire. And I'm not gonna bet against him. I think he's gonna have a shot. And so we'll see, it's exciting, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. And, uh, but he's a great, great uh, young man. I'm, I could not be more proud as, as a father of him. And, and you're right, I so appreciate, Scott, you mentioning this. While this book, Trust Inspire, might be seen as a leadership book for people in business and education and healthcare and government, and it is, I think its greatest impact and benefit is gonna happen to people at a personal level, for their personal lives, for them in their homes, as a, as a parent, as a nan, as an uncle, as a, as a grandparent, um, in their communities, as a neighbor, as a friend. And the whole premise is you can apply this in any context in life, in any role. And the key to becoming a trust and inspire leader is to first become a trust and inspire person. And hopefully I've been that kind of person and parent for Britain and for my other children and hopefully I try to be that way with, with my wife and our family. And hopefully I try to be that way in all aspects of life. And that's inspiring. So this, this is, you know, the subtitle of the book is How Truly Great Leaders Unleash Greatness in Others. And that's in organizations, but it's also in all of life. And I think the greatest applications will be found in that arena, in those arenas. So that's why I'm excited about this book. Stephen, it's something to live in the shadow of your father because you have his name, right? The, the incomparable author, Stephen M. R. Covey, or Stephen R. Covey, but you have done your father and mother and siblings proud and all of your colleagues from around the world in the Franklin Covey family. Very excited to have the privilege to talk about your book today. We wish you and your team the best of success, including your co-authors, David Casperson, Gary Judd, and your daughter, who's also joined you on the book. Congrats to you as you enter what is the indefatigable journey of a new author, the whirlwind of press and keynote speaking around the world. I'm sure you'll be in great demand in the coming years. Look forward also to releasing the Trust and Inspire module inside of Franklin Covey's All Access Pass. Look forward to having you back here in a couple hundred interviews from now 
as we get into the future of our podcast for your next book. Stephen Amar, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Scott. Always great to be with you. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for your time. We'll see you back here next week for a new topic on leadership. <music>